Hey, and welcome. We are studying the book of Exodus, and we're in chapter 23, and today we're going to do verses 20 to 23. Let's read them out, and then we'll comment here as we go. Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your adversaries and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. So here we have this kind of shift. We've been looking at all these law stuff, and now we're uh, going to be shifting along the way here. Here come some instructions, and uh, God's going to send his angel before you. So Malak, Malachi, the, the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament is my, Malachi means my messenger. Uh, for and, then, and we have this also a messenger angel. There's a lot of overlap. That's about what that is. An angel is an angelic. It's a certain order of being, but he's also a messenger. Angel means messenger. So here we have this message. I'm going to send my angel before you. What does this mean? Who is this? Is this, uh, is this Gabriel or something? Who's going the, uh, before them? So there's some different bits here. I want to hit real quickly here. Why does the angel show up? Well, he's there to guard them, the text says. The text says he's there to guide them, to bring them into the place that God is taking them to. So the angel has a certain mission. The angel's kind of got a guardian mission. He's going with them. He is leading and guarding and protecting and facilitating. He's helping them go from point A to point B. Point A was Egypt. Point B is the promised land. And so his mission is to get them through. Now, there's questions about who is this angel? Uh, who is this? Is this God himself? Is this uh, a certain angelic being? What is it? And there's really, as you look at this, and if you look at Jesus and the mission of Jesus and the mission of this angel, they're really quite similar. There's all kinds of overlaps all over the place here. I'm not going to read them all to you. But notice if you remember John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And there's all kinds of parallels in the scripture between this angel here in Exodus and Jesus in his work. And so Jesus is guiding and guarding and protecting and leading, getting his people through to the end. So there's a lot of parallels. And this angel, indeed, Jesus is kind of the angel of the Lord. Now, Jesus is God. Don't misunderstand. He's actually God, literally God, completely God. One part, uh, he, there is one God. There's three persons in God. It's kind of hard to really put it into words, and there's arguments today about how we express that. Uh, there are at least three distinct personalities, and, and yet there's only one God. Jesus is often the, represented in the Bible as the angel of God in the Old Testament. He is the messenger of God. He is also God himself. So there's all kinds of overlaps here. And uh, I think what Hamilton, in Hamilton's commentary, he says, Israel has access to the divine law now and for times to come. They will have access to the divine presence via the Lord's representative. Hamilton, page 435. So um, Hamilton is suspicious that this is God. Then you go to, don't I have a comment, I think, from Stuart. Stewart's commentary, page 543. It becomes clearer as the discourse progresses that the angel and Yahweh are one and the same. And here what they both say is treated as, as synonymous with each other. So, yeah, when you look at this, it's very interesting. Now, let's look at some more business here. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him. Well, should we ever be rebellious toward Jesus? No. Should we obey the voice of Jesus always? Yes. But what about this part? Doesn't this part uh, give you uh, a trouble if this is Jesus? What does it say? Do not be rebellious toward him, verse 21, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. Well, God's name is his character. So this is telling us that, you know, he's doing God's work. And indeed, Jesus is the rock that followed them. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, chapter 10. Look at the first verses in that chapter. So I think there's a good case to be made here that this is actually Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. He's not hasn't come in human flesh yet. He's leading them and guarding them. And why then? Uh, well, I thought he. I thought Jesus was the big forgiver. I thought he just forgives every which thing. But wait a minute, because um, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not teach that there are things that uh, God's just going to forgive every which thing. There are actually some things that it says that you cannot. Uh, that God will not forgive. There are things that can't be can't be corrected. 
And so, uh, but yes, so many things are. God will take our sins as far as the east is from the west. Unless we have uh, committed the unpardonable sin, that's another topic here. But it is possible to go so far. I believe Satan is one who's gone so far that he can't be corrected. And then that means that uh, there's no way he can ever repent. He has basically broken himself irrevocably. But you and I are not in that space, but surely we have not committed the unpardonable sin. Surely we still have a, a spiritual interest in us, and God is still working. And yet I haven't arrived, and perhaps you haven't arrived, and God is still working on us. But what about this? Um, well, you know, they're going to go into the land. We need to obey God's command, or you would be destroyed in the wilderness. So it's very critical for these people, just coming out of slavery, just receiving God's law back and kind of getting tuned up. They need to follow God's guidance and his instructions. Hey, there are two million or more of them out here in the middle of the desert. No Taco Bell, right? No, uh, no, no Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> There's no place for them to go. Uh, they've got to live there. God's providing free food, manna every morning. Uh, they, it's, good. it's a good idea to follow God's guidance. And so follow the guidance of Jesus always, and you will not be in trouble. But uh, here, they're warned. You better, you better toe the line because, yeah, you're in a very dangerous place. The devil would have loved to destroy. And as we look through the, the whole story uh, from Exodus, as they finally land in the promised land, uh, we find the devil's been working very, 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 very hard to destroy God's people. So anyway, we want to follow Jesus. It will never harm us. It will always be our help to do what he says. Like Mary said to them, you know, when uh, they were at the wedding, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, and he, she just tells the people, look, whatever Jesus says to you, just do it. That's really some of the best advice you'll receive in your entire life. Whatever Jesus says to you in his scriptures, do it. And that will always turn out well. One more thing I want to touch here. And it might seem kind of uh, irritating, but it's in verse 23. We read it. Uh, my angel will go before you and bring you into the land. And then there's five or six nations listed here. Actually, there's six or seven almost every time, the same six or seven. But notice what he says after he lists the nations, the Hittites, the Amorites, and so on. And I will completely destroy them. What? Now, is God one who just arbitrarily says, uh, oh, I don't like the, that group of people. I'm just going to completely destroy them. Is that, is that the way God is? Well, no, that's not, that's not the way God is. The only people that ever get destroyed are people who are filled with rebellion against God's kingdom, are people who, who, who pollute his ways, and they're people who mess with his people. Okay, so those people are in trouble. And uh, notice here, if we go back to Genesis, I think, what is it, 15, 16? That's here, let me, let me read 14 to 16, Genesis 15. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. That's the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, isn't it? As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good and old age, 16. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. So they go away and they come back. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So Genesis 15, 16 is, is inferring to us there's coming a time when the iniquity, the sin, the, the, the transgression, the rebellion of the Amorites is going to become complete. And when the rebellion, when sin is full grown and it comes to completeness, what's the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. And so different nations also have sort of a counter that's kept. And when a nation reaches the place where its cup of iniquity is full, when it hasn't repented, hasn't repented, hasn't repented, hasn't repented, God says, all right, we're done here and God sets that nation aside. So these are people who have chosen evil, chosen evil, chosen evil. They've never turned back, and at, one, at a point, God says, okay, your, your time is over, done. Okay, so yeah, the Amorites that are listed over here in Exodus 23, uh, their time wasn't full, but there comes a time when it is full, and that's where God says in 23, I will completely destroy them. I will bring you into the land of the Amorites. So it's not without cause, but that's kind of a larger issue than we can address in, in a three or four minute devotional today. So probably I'm already over four minutes. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning.